Yo, guys, it's Kyle coming at you from Bane's Film Reviews. Today, I am sitting down with Peter Hoffman Kimball. He is the writer, director, and producer of Millstone, which is a short film that is completely in American Sign Language. Um, it's the first short film I've ever seen uh, put together that way. It was fantastic. It showcased at Slam Dance just a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm so excited to have Peter here with me today. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. How are we doing? Do, doing great. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, and then, so before we even get into the film, uh, I am curious how you got into filmmaking in the first place. Yeah, I went to, uh, I went to college and, uh, you know, I always, I grew up, I grew up loving movies. I remember, uh, my parents didn't want me watching like adult, uh, not, not adult films, but like anything too uh, adult oriented, but yeah, they, they were like, you know, if it was before the ratings existed, I guess it's fine. So I watched all sorts of like Errol Flynn movies and James <laughs> Cagney movies. Like when I was uh, probably the only eight year old in my town watching those. But uh, so I grew up watching a lot of movies. I went to college and um, I w took a film class. They said, if you come here to learn how to make movies, you're at the wrong college. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're just going to discuss them. We're just going to discuss them for uh, as long as you're taking them here. So. I ended up going on to a graduate school and and uh, at, a, at a at a program that was a little bit more oriented toward actually making movies, and that's okay. That's sort of where I um, sort of honed those skills a little bit. Very nice. And where did you end up going for uh, for your graduate? So I, I I went to I went to Brown for my undergrad, and then American in in here in uh, Washington D.C. for my graduate school. Oh wow, that that's impressive. Good for you. <laughs> Um, and then, so obviously I'm curious, where did the idea for Millstone come from? So Millstone, on a story level, it just came to me, um, I think as a father, just thinking about some of the, um, some of the f fears I have with my own children, just thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, suddenly you, you have all these uh, vulnerabilities that you didn't have before you had kids and, and yeah. you know, what could go wrong and what would that do to your relationship and all the, all those kinds of thoughts and so I had those kind of things, you know, in my mind. And then I just, uh, you know, that's where, that's where it came from, I think. And then the film is entirely in sign language. And my, uh, one of my sons is deaf. And, and so it's been okay. a big, big part of our family um, learning sign language, which is still in process, but, but learning sign language and, uh, and really looking into the deaf community and, and trying to, trying to become more a part of that and contribute more to that. Oh, very, very cool. I'm sure. How old's your son? He's four. I, I'm sure when he gets older, he'll appreciate this very much that you took the time to create such a fantastic film, kind of, uh, I guess, maybe in his image or in his honor. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's a weird film to uh, to have have sort of in that, <laughs> in that position, but I just like the idea of there being more films out there in sign language with deaf actors and just showing that yeah. that's a that's a possibility. Yeah. Well, with Coda, I think that kind of made everybody aware that something like this could exist in the mainstream and it could be recognized as being as good as, as other films. And these actors could be recognized as being just as talented as everyone else in Hollywood. Um, and so obviously you kind of had that to help, to help support you in some way where you already sort of had this following that was aware of the films of this nature, but what, what about this film and, and with it being in sign language, what, what spoke to you and said, yeah, I think, that people will be able to understand and appreciate this and even more so access it. Because I think to some degree, there's a language barrier there. It's like watching a foreign film. There is that disconnect there's, or there's a potential for the disconnect. So what said to you? Yeah. I think that people will be able to access this. Definitely. I, I mean, and I think that's a great question. Um, and uh, you know, one of the actors in the film is it was in CODA and he had mm -hmm. a you know great experience in, in, in that. And, and I think really showcases acting in that. But um, to me, I think, you know, two, two big, two big films that really spoke to me were CODA and Parasite. That, mm -hmm. uh, okay. that, but uh, you know, Parasite was a film that I was just blown away by. And I think so many people were, yeah. And it's uh, it's completely in Korean. I mean, it's you yeah. know, and I feel like that was a film, too, where I didn't say, you know, I'm eating my vegetables. I'm, uh, you know, trying to be learned and sophisticated by watching a foreign film. It was just this is an amazing, you know, rip roaring, fun film and yeah. dark and, you know, all the things that are in the movie Parasite. But 
the, the fact that it's in Korean, I moved past very quickly. And I, I thought, yeah. I, I think there's a little bit of, you know, whether it's that or Squid Game or there's so many, so many programs on uh, Netflix now and, and different mm -hmm. streamers where people I think are more used to watching things uh, in other languages. And it, it definitely is some separation and, and that, that can be a challenge, but I think it's, it's never been a better time for, for people to be open to that. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think like diversity is becoming more and more mainstream. I think it is mainstream now. It's not, not that it's becoming that anymore. Um, and I, I've, I've stressed many times in many of my reviews and talking with friends and, and other people that the idea of forcing diversity into a film is very frustrating. This happens very naturally. It, it just works. It's very organic and it works the way it's supposed to. And that's another reason why it's so accessible because we don't feel like we're being, we're being forced to think a certain way when we're watching it. Um, and to your point about Parasite, that's a, that's a really good comparison, Parasite and Coda, because they were so groundbreaking in terms of just being able to be recognized in the mainstream for the first time in their own, in their own way, one being a foreign film and one being in sign language. Um, so that's really cool that you use those, use Coda obviously for inspiration, but Parasite's an interesting one. And I, I like the connection there. Um, and then, so you mentioned uh, Daniel Durant. Um, obviously he was a part of Coda and he's a part of Millstone as well. He's essentially the main character in Millstone. Um, I'm curious other than, I mean, him being a fantastic actor, how, why did you choose him and how did he eventually become part of the film? Yeah, I so I'm based in Washington, D.C., which is home to uh, Gallaudet University, which is the mm -hmm. big deaf university here. And um, and so I worked with one of my uh, producing partners, a man named Gary Brooks, who, who worked at Gallaudet for a long year, for a long time. And he uh, he's deaf and he had worked with Daniel when Daniel was a student. Okay. And so we actually started the process. Um, you know, Coda had had, you know, played big at Sundance and, and I think it was out. I hadn't even seen Coda yet, but yeah. Gary, my producing partner, uh, you know, was telling me Daniel is just a great guy to work with. He's a good actor too, but he's just a great guy to work with. I think he'd be mm. really fun to work with. And so I reached out through his agent and manager um, and, and uh, he liked the script. It, it was, a, I think that he has said it, it was a nice opportunity to do something where, it wasn't at all about him being deaf and mm -hmm. you know, he he's at a place where he does get some good opportunities, but, yeah. uh, but often it's as the deaf character. And I, yeah. I think this was a nice chance to, um, to do something where he could, you know, he is deaf. He, he doesn't have to pretend he's not, but yeah. that's not a part of the plot. Yeah. I think you definitely break down another wall because I think like him and, uh, and Troy that won, uh, at, won the, uh, at the Oscars last year. Um, I think they're still viewed as being the deaf character they're still viewed as that's kind of their lane they're almost almost viewed as like a character actor in a way where they're they're expected to kind of fill one specific part of a film and you're absolutely right being deaf has nothing to do with this film whatsoever it just so happens that they are and it's a story that's completely disconnected from that and it just sort of allows in a lot of ways allows allows Daniel and Eddie and everyone to uh, be able to express themselves in a unique way where they are so good with their facial expressions and so good with their body language in ways that maybe other people don't have to be, but I don't, I also don't know if they're capable of, I think that they're able to channel this in such a way. It's so good. Just watching, watching Daniel's face throughout the duration of the film. It's so good. He's so intense for the entire thing. And it's awesome. Yeah, they, they do a great job. And I, and I think that is a little bit, you know, that's the beauty of sign language that it, it isn't just the hands, it's the face right. and it's the whole body. And, and I think one thing with, with doing the film where that, that was going to be the whole film in sign language um, and working with deaf people on the crew and, and, and in production, it was mm. something that we were very aware of that we wanted to make uh, a strength of the film. And I think sometimes if you just have a deaf character you just want to add in as some diversity. Yeah. Maybe you haven't done the thinking of, you know, all that a deaf person can offer to the role and, yeah. and what that, what that could be. And so I, I, I really like that we were able to incorporate that more here. Yeah. It showcases very well throughout the film. Um, and, and then with it being in, in sign language, I feel like you face a unique challenge where you still want there to be a score, 
but you don't have the ability of the dialogue cutting through the score and being louder than the score. And I, I feel like you face a challenge where it that score might overpower the things that are happening on like on screen and the, the dialogue that's taking place because you're trying to listen and you're trying to read at the same time. Um, but you and Carson uh, have created something that while it's still strong and it supports the, the drama in the film and it supports the film as a whole, it fits just right. And it always sits just behind everyone. It's, it's never, it's never the equal. It's never stronger than anyone on set. How do you go about go how, how do you go about doing that? And like, what's the, the greatest challenge of that, that whole aspect of the film? I mean, I, I think, you know, working with, with Carson doing the sound and, and, uh, and, and Paul who did the score, they um, really, you know, that's just professionalism. That's them being good at, at their jobs. And I think, yeah. you know, as a director sort of working with them and, and then I, it is just a, it is just a challenge, uh, you know, sort of a balancing act of, of, um, you know, striking that right tone. And, and I think it is also a question of, you know, who is this film for? And, yeah. or is it, is it for different people in different ways? I, I think there's something to be said for, you know, the film could work if you are deaf Mm -hmm. And you're not getting any of that sound. Um, but at the same time, if you're hearing, you're used to there being sound and you're used yeah. to you know being being pulled along a little along a little bit with that. So I wanted their I wanted it to work for a hearing audience as well, um, or or just as much. So it it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a tricky balancing act, but I'm I'm glad uh, I'm glad it, it worked out as well as it did. Yeah, it really, really did. Um and then so with the story itself, um, like you said, you had some inspiration being a father and kind of honing in on the fears that you have being a parent. Um, but what seems like it's going to be a pretty straightforward film about loss eventually contorts into something entirely different that I had not expected. Um, I sit there and I think I try to think throughout the entire film and basically ruin films for myself before I get to the end. Um, and I could I could have never figured this out. It, it was really, really well done. But I am curious why you decided to shift from that very linear drama to something a lot more twisted. To me, to me, the twist was always the point. Um, okay. And that was that was a big part of it. The the setting, the theme uh, you know, is drawing on my my fears and, you know, my you know being a parent and everything. But to me, the beginning of the film and this couple coming in for therapy is a little bit more the setup that gets to what I was really going for, as opposed to, you know, the latter part being diverging from what, what I was meaning. So, um, you know, I, I definitely love the work of um, Neil LeBute, uh, playwright and filmmaker, who he, he's he's a real master at uh, unexpected twists and, mm -hmm. and think, you know, things that really change your whole perception of what's happened before. And I, I really like the idea with this of, of, um, Hey buddy, <laughs> of, of sort of a, um, us, you build up to the, you build up to the big twist by, oh buddy, buddy, by having a second <laughs> twist by there. Hold on, hold on one second. It's sure. Yeah. Okay. My friend. Hi. Okay. Hold on one second. Sure. Sorry about that, but um, no, no worries at all. But just on a creative level, I liked the idea of uh, you know you, you start things off in sort of a linear fashion, then it kind of seems like you're going to reveal something, and um, and that's that's a little bit of a of a red herring for what you ultimately reveal. That I, I like that as sort of just a creative construct. Yeah, and so. My wife and I just watched Christopher Nolan's Memento last night for the first time. I had never seen it before, um, but this kind of has a similar feel. Millstone does to uh, to Memento, where you're you kind of have an idea that maybe something's up, but you maybe you can't put your finger on it. Whereas Memento, I kind of figured it out ahead of time. I was like, that you know that kind of makes sense. The twist in yours, I feel like, is put together significantly better and that's not to say that memento was bad by any means it's fantastic i just thought that millstone's twist was was much better so well i will take i'll take that to the <laughs> bank thank you yeah, of course of course um and then so 
a lot of the film is shot using over the over the, you see a lot of over the over the shoulder shots if i could get that out um behind eddie um and i feel like so my take on that was that i mean you sit down with someone to interview them because they're of importance i mean you don't just sit down and interview someone just kind of for the hell of it so it it kind of intensifies their conversation and it makes the characters on screen feel more important and the subject matter feel more important. But I'm curious why you didn't choose, you know, a bigger space, why you didn't expand a little bit more. I, again, I really like the way that it was done because I feel like it, it makes everything in the film more important, but I'm curious what your thought process was when you chose these, these yeah. uh, particular shots. I mean, I, and I, and I'm, I have a plan of, a sort of a feature version of this, which would expand on on the space and expand on the story. But um, mm. I think I think part of this was the the idea of just being confined in one location, one mm. space, um, and a lot of it also is just the technical uh, requirements of, of shooting sign language. Well, I think that I, I wanted okay. I wanted both to showcase the sign language and also make sure that if you are watching this, paying attention to the signing that you're getting everything. And okay. so I didn't want, um, I didn't want the camera to be moving too much uh, or much at all. I didn't want, yeah. uh, it, it definitely limits how much you can cut from one shot to another. So there, there definitely is a lot to the style there that is really a function of wanting to be able to, to showcase the sign language. Okay. Um, and then I, I guess I think th this idea of, this confined space there's there's something um i i like on a creative level just this idea that in this room uh it's it's an unassuming room and yet whole worlds can fall apart and, and yeah something like that that's a really cool concept um but it, it also creates somewhat of like a sense of claustrophobia where you're feeling like like these characters are unable to you know to to move away from this this one particular space at least for the majority of the film the characters don't move um and they're sort of confined to this one area and i feel like that plays into the the narrative as well and again it works awesome um so i hope you didn't misconstrue that as me saying well why didn't you do something better because i think you did the best possible thing well thank you thank you yeah, um yeah it's uh yeah. yeah I think that's that's just sort of the uh the the style we were going for here but I think that claustrophobia is part of the part of the tone we were going for yeah yeah and it, and it and it comes through and I think it's understood very well just like the rest of the film I feel like viewers are able to access that pretty pretty easily for the most part um and then so I know that you guys uh, just showed at slam dance not that long ago um and that's where I was able to, or I was able to watch it because you sent me a screener. Um, but that's, that's why I was able to, cause I ended up on a, a, a list, I suppose. Um, but uh, I want to know where other people, other people can watch this. Yeah, we, um, it's going to be, it's going to be a little while until it's sort of available to the world, mm -hmm. but um, it, we had, we had the good fortune of playing at slam dance. We actually won the mm -hmm. grand jury prize at slam dance, which is really that's nice. Awesome. Um, uh, it's going to be playing, uh, in Washington, D.C., at, at the D.C. Independent Film Festival in a couple weeks. Um, and then I, I imagine at other festivals around the around the country in, in the, for the rest of the year. But um, uh, just just Millstone, the movie dot com will be updating that with uh, with with all the, the different dates and festivals. That's awesome. Um, and I'm sure you're incredibly busy with uh, the festival run right now. But are you, are you working on anything else right now? I actually. I, so I shot last year a, a feature film entirely in sign language. Uh, oh, wow. it's, a, it's a dark comedy called I'll Sleep When You're Dead about uh, a, a man who is trying to avenge his wife's murder, but he's the least intimidating man in the world. Okay. And uh, so it's it's about 12 actors all in sign language. And it, that's a very niche movie that I, I'm not sure that the general uh, world public is going to be uh, as interested in it, but but that's something that I that will be premiering later this year, and and definitely okay. I think for a deaf audience is going to be uh, a, a really nice a nice film. Which but but also you know English subtitles it'll be available to everybody. Um, but then as I said, yeah, I'm working on trying to uh, take Millstone into the feature realm. That's that would be nice. definitely a goal moving forward. Fantastic. Well, best of luck on both of those. I look forward to 
hopefully getting to watch both. Um, and then, uh, so my, my last question for you is what are some of your favorite films? That's a, that's a great question. I, I love movies. I love watching, uh, all sorts of movies, good and bad. I, I, I find that. I, so, but if I, um, I've, I've thought about this and, um, I love, uh, Goodwill hunting. Okay. It's just a sentimental favorite. I'm from the Boston area and I, I love that. The Godfather, just hard to beat the Godfather, um, in the company of men, which was Neil Labute's big, uh, introduction to the world. Uh, there's a, there's a German film called, I believe it, it's called Gegen die Wand in, okay. in German. It's called Head On, I think, the way it's translated in English. But that's Fatih Akin. That's that's definitely uh, one of my favorites. And um, okay. and then I would say The Adventures of Robin Hood, Errol Flynn, going back to you know the the action movies that I was allowed to watch when I was a kid. So yeah, going back to the I think 1937 or whatever. But that's every action movie since it's just playing off of those tropes. So yeah. I, I love that one. That's a good list. That's a great list. Um, but Peter, thank you again for sitting down with me, guys. I have Peter Hoffman Table sitting down with me. Um, he is the writer, director, producer of Millstone. Follow him. Uh, check out the website. Figure out where you can watch it. Please do. It's fantastic. And thank you again, Peter, for spending some time with me. All right. Thanks so much, Kyle. You're more than welcome. You have a great day. All right. You too. Bye. Thanks.